Okay, so let's get started. So welcome to uh, this environmental research seminar series <coughs> uh, sponsored by the, the Integrated Health Science Core of the Michigan Life Stage Environmental Exposures and Disease Center. Uh, I am very pleased to introduce uh, today's speaker, Dr. Uh, Edward P. Zellers. So Dr. Zellers is professor of environmental health sciences and chemistry. And also he's the director of the occupational health program of the NIOSHI funded education and research center training grant. He also uh, served as a group leader in the NSF funded engineering research center for wireless integrated microsystem, also known as WIMS. Dr. Zellers received a bachelor degree in chemistry from Rutgers University and Master of Science and PhD in Environmental Health uh, Science from UC Berkeley. He joined the University of Michigan uh, in 1987. So he has been here for 33 years and this is his 34th year anniversary. And unfortunately, uh, this is his last term. He's uh, retiring. What do you um, mean, unfortunately? <laughs> uh, we will miss you anyway. <laughs> So Dr. Zeller's research and teaching programs are uh, concerned with various aspects of characterizing and controlling human exposure to toxic chemicals, sampling and analytical method and instrumentation, assessment strategies, and protective equipment. Uh, so today, he will talk about a wearable microsystem for direct measurement of multi-VOC worker exposure. So please join me and welcome Dr. Zellers. Okay, well, thank you, Sankun, for the introduction. And um, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming to my talk. Uh, since Sankun gave you the title here, uh, I'll just uh, sort of fill it in with these subtitles. So um, th what I'm gonna tell you about here is, is a project that really represents essentially the culmination of about 20 years of work in my group. And the types of microsystems that we're talking about are gas chromatographic microsystems, GCs. And uh, we make the components of these systems using uh, microfabrication techniques um, on silicon chips. So one sort of pet name for this area of research is GC on a chip. And uh, our pet name for the uh, prototypes that I'll be telling you about uh, uh, is given here, Personal Exposure Monitoring Microsystems, or PEM. I want to acknowledge my co-authors right away here, and I, I, I listed them with different colors to sort of overemphasize the fact that in order to do this kind of work, you really require deep expertise in a number of different areas. So EHS is, the, is my home department, but I also am appointed in chemistry, and I have had chemistry PhD students working on the project. I had a student from applied physics because I'm also affiliated with that program. And then we have collaborators, not only in mechanical engineering, but also in electrical engineering. And then one of my former students, Willie Steinecker, uh, graduated some years ago and started a company. And so we collaborated with him to build the prototypes that I'll show you. Uh, and then as Sung Kyun pointed out, uh, I've been affiliated with the Center for Wireless Integrated Microsensing and Systems uh, for a long time. I had a leadership role in, in that uh, center and uh, without that, uh, that affiliation, none of this work would have been possible. So here's my outline. I'll provide a few introductory remarks just to put the work in context, give you a quick uh, tutorial on uh, gas chromatography and a quick snapshot of some of the other work uh, here at Michigan that's going on, parallel efforts in GC on a chip work, uh, and then focus on um, two prototypes, mostly on the generation two uh, prototype of PEM and uh, go into the components and, and lab characterizations and then focus on uh, the power that comes from using uh, sensor arrays as detectors in these instruments and then a quick uh, discussion of our uh, first results from mock field testing. So this can be a pretty technical talk and uh, hopefully it'll uh, retain your interest. So uh, VOCs are uh, ubiquitous. The, we're we're breathing them all the time, uh, both outside and inside. And in fact, all of us are generating VOCs and exhaling them, polluting the air, if you will. 
uh, because we produce them as part of normal metabolism. Uh, luckily, the concentrations we generate are, are very low, so uh, no health effects and uh, no uh, discernible significant air pollution. And of course, in the workplace, we run into VOCs uh, uh, in, in different uh, operations. And it's here in the workplace that I'm going to focus my talk. Um, and so in the workplace, uh, by virtue of the processes involved and the regulations, we generally run into VOCs in the, the concentration range listed here. Maybe it's two to three orders of magnitude you'll run into in, in the workplace from PPB to PPM. And then uh, collectively, the health effects uh, that uh, are ascribable to exposure to VOCs, they really run the entire gamut of health effects that uh, one can encounter in the environment, from uh, rather mild narcosis, CNS effects, respiratory tract irritation to more serious uh, systemic uh, 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 health effects such as cancer and reproductive. Uh, one of the challenges we face in doing exposure assessment or instrument building, as I'll talk about, is that you rarely, uh, you rarely encounter VOCs alone as individual compounds, but rather in mixtures. And the complexity of the mixture can range from relatively simple, just a few or a handful, to uh, literally hundreds of compounds at once. So here are just some images of work situations, work processes where uh, exposure to, to VOC mixtures would uh, be encountered. Luckily in this country and in, in most developed countries, we have organizations that uh, help to set uh, standards or limits to exposure. And in this country, uh, the American Conference of Governmental Industrial Hygienists is uh, one of the primary organizations we rely on to set guideline values or limits, and the, these are called the uh, threshold limit values or TLVs. Uh, these are reviewed uh, annually, and so they publish a booklet, and uh, here this is the 2020 version of it. And I've just picked a couple or a few co uh, common VOCs here to, and listed their TLVs. And you can see they're, they're actually pretty high by, by in exposure standards in the tens to hundreds of ppm. Some are much lower, and, and some are actually a bit higher than that, but these are sort of typical. Uh, one of the overriding uh, points to make, though, is that um, in order to demonstrate compliance with guidelines like these, and by the way, these complement the OSHA standards uh, that we have that are the legal limits, uh, and, and all of these organizations uh, mandate that you collect personal exposures, meaning uh, exposure measurements from devices that are worn by the worker, and this is in recognition of the uh, uh, spatial and temporal variability in uh, the concentrations of VOCs that can occur in the workplace and that the only way to capture what a person's exposed to is to actually put the, the device on their body. And so this is a, a, an important point for us. So whether we're talking about uh, regulations, guidelines, compliance with these regulations, or if we're talking about epidemiologic studies looking at health effects, trying to establish uh, risk estimates of uh, associated with exposure to certain chemicals, uh, we really need to know what is out there and how much. And, and, and so the term speciated analysis is used here to, to, dic to, to indicate that you want to know exactly which compounds you're being exposed to, and, and you really have to do this quantitatively. And so the, the complexity of that challenge is, uh, is sort of embodied in the fact that the standard method that we use in the workplace to assess exposures is really relatively old fashioned. So here's a picture of a, of a worker guy and he's wearing a personal sampling pump and then is, uh, and he's, it's connected to a, a sorbent tube that he's clipped to his lapel in his breathing zone. And so uh, we would sample air for several hours or perhaps the whole working day of eight hours and then send the, uh, the sampler tubes off to the lab and that would be analyzed by a, by a, an instrument such as this uh, bench scale gas chromatograph in the lab. And, and so we get integrated exposure measurements. If we think about uh, technology and trying to uh, do this with instruments, at one end of the spectrum are instruments like these. These are handheld um, and to, to, to do the VOC measurements, uh, both of these use photoionization detectors. Uh, this is a multi-gas detector, but the other gases it detects are inorganic gases, not VOCs. And then there are other handheld instruments, some that use photoionization or metal oxide semiconductor, but the point is they have a single sensor. There's no selectivity. 
They provide total VOC or TVOC, a composite measure, and so they have limited utility for the applications we have in mind up here. At the other end of the spectrum are much more, uh, uh, much larger and more sophisticated instruments, such as uh, these two portable gas chromatograph mass spectrometers. These are portable. Um, and then there's a Fourier transform infrared spectrophotometer that can provide speciated quantitative analysis of VOC mixtures. But as you can see, they're quite large. Uh, they're very expensive. Uh, this is uh, $50,000. This is close to $100,000 to get into the field. So they're not, they're not uh, suitable for routine deployment, uh, sensor networks, or in our case, what we're particularly interested in is a wearable monitoring uh, microsystem. So there's a technology gap here. And this is what we view as uh, the, the sort of the place, the niche that we're looking to fill with our GC-based microsystems that employ micro sensor array detectors, and those detectors are important. So to drive this point home, here is a hypothetical exposure profile here, concentration versus time for three arbitrarily chosen uh, VOCs. And the point is that with regard to personal exposure monitoring, it's not possible to get this information from any technology that exists. So, Here's a quick primer on uh, how a gas chromatograph works. Every GC has three basic components, an injector, a column, and a detector. And then there has to be some sort of carrier gas that can be pressurized. Uh, and, uh, and so a typical column uh, would have a length of 30 meters in a bench scale instrument, and a typical detector would be a, a photo or flame ionization detector. So to go into a little bit more detail, you know, the heart of any GC system is the column, and I've shown that in cartoon form here. Uh, typical columns are of capillary dimension to about 100 to 250 microns in diameter, and they will have a thin wall coating of a polymer called a stationary phase. And then you uh, in inject your mixture of VOCs, which I've re represented by these different shapes and colors, shown here, and I've assigned them names, but these are, of course, uh, uh, arbitrary. Um, and I'm showing a cartoon syringe here. There are other ways to inject through a loop or through a pre-concentrator. So you inject them as a, as a bolus here together as a composite, and then under the uh, pressure or flow provided by the carrier gas, they will be pushed down the column. Um, and then as they do so, they will reversibly partition into the wall uh, coating of the polymer, and they'll do that thousands or hundreds of thousands of times, depending on the length of the column. And since most chemicals have different structures or volatility, they will have different partition coefficients. And that leads to different retention factors. So that if your column is long enough, you will be able to separate these in, in space or in time, if you will, so that by the time they get to the end of the column, your detector will see them as separated peaks like this. And with a single channel detector like this, the, uh, the only way to tell what the compound is, is by its retention time, the point at which it comes out of the column. And then to tell how much is there, you have to integrate the area under these peaks. And so one metric for the, for the separation is the resolution, the change in the, the difference in retention time over the peak width. Uh, typical stationary phases are uh, PDMS, uh, polydimethyl siloxane. That's sort of the, the standard basic go-to column. And of course, uh, longer columns yield better separations. And as I say, the benchmark here is 30 meters. So um, here at Michigan, uh, as I alluded to earlier, uh, my, the, the Center for Wireless Integrated Microsystems has been in existence since the, since the year 2000. And uh, we got some big funding from NSF back then to work on uh, GC technology. And so we had a lot of investigators doing so. Um, and this was sort of our working diagram. So you can look at this as sort of the archetype of the analytical subsystem layout of, of a universal uh, WIMS uh, gas chromatograph. Uh, I've highlighted here the fact that uh, although most of the scaling laws uh, for GC are favorable as you miniaturize, uh, one place where that is not the case is in the length of column that you can support in an inherently micro system. So typical uh, uh, column lengths will max out at about six meters as opposed to the 30 that I was referring to for the bench scale. So we have to work on uh, making up for that uh, sort of inherent deficiency. 
So there are the, the three key components to NEGC are represented by these cartoon icons here. Um, the injector also serves in this case for this, you know, portable instrument that we're going to deploy in the field also as a sampler. So it serves two functions and we call that the pre-concentrator focuser or micro PCF. And, all the, and then the separation module is shown here. And then here is the detector. And for our detector, we use an array of, of, of chemical sensors called chemi resistors. So let me just uh, walk you through this. So any, uh, any uh, analysis requires two steps. We first have to uh, capture a sample. So if we have our VOC mixture out here in the environment, we have an onboard miniature pump uh, that will draw samples into the system and across this pre-concentrator focuser, which is typically packed with adsorbent materials. It can be a uh, single or multi-stage, um, and we capture all of the VOCs on this. So we have to sample a certain volume of air to capture enough mass so that we can uh, exceed the detection limits of the chemi-resistor array. Um, and then we reverse the direction of flow. We'll heat very rapidly so that we desorb the vapors on the preconcentrator and inject them into the separation module represented by these two sort of convolved square spirals here. Uh, one of the key metrics of a preconcentrator is not only its capacity, but also the second one is its injection sharpness. So it's, that's an important feature to keep in mind. And so uh, to make up for the fact that we have relatively short columns uh, uh, with microsystems, we can play all sorts of tricks. Now, some systems just have a single column, uh, but some of the systems we've developed have two columns, and we can put two different stationary phases represent, represented by the, co uh, the colors here. So a nonpolar and a polar stationary phase will have complementary uh, separation characteristics, and that can enhance performance. We can also temperature program them here at different rates using onboard microheaters. And that adds versatility. And then for some of our systems, we've incorporated a modulator at the midpoint where we can actually cryogenically freeze and then ballistically heat and re-inject compounds coming out of the first column into the second column to enhance the separation capabilities. So we have built systems with all of these, and I'll be talking about one system that, that has some of these components to it. So the point is we do our best job of separation, uh, present the uh, hopefully separated compounds to the detector. As I said, we use an array of, of detectors or sensors called chemi-resistors, and I've presented here just the uh, four traces from the multiple sensors that would be in there. And uh, what you'll notice is we get a chromatogram, a trace from each one of the sensors, uh, but by uh, incorporating selectivity into the chemi-resistor, we can actually get different responses from each of the channels in this for different compounds. And the way we do that is to deposit layers of what we call MPNs, or monolayer-protected nanoparticles, onto the different uh, chemi-resistors. And these are just gold nanoparticles with self-assembled monolayers on the surface that are functionalized differently so that they give rise to different responses in the sensors. <laughs> so if we look at any one retention time corresponding to any one compound, uh, you can get a crude pattern here, or a spectrum, if you will, that can sort of serve to identify the compound and differentiate it from others that might be eluding nearby or even co-eluding, as I'll talk about later. So it's a combination of uh, potentially selective preconcentration, the inherent selectivity of separation, and then the added selectivity of response patterns that we combine in our systems to get this goal of reliable multi-VOC analysis. And of course, there are a ton of uh, applications that would benefit from this kind of capability. And we've explored many of these over the years in my research group. And the one I'm going to focus on today is, is human and particularly worker exposure monitoring. Now, our group is not the only group to be working on GC here at Michigan, and I want to acknowledge uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Professor Gyanchandani, and then another colleague, Professor Fan, and then another colleague, Professor Kurabayashi, who are all working uh, on their own parallel paths to, uh, to this uh, image here. So this image um, was one that we developed early on in the WIMS Center as being our sort of iconic uh, vision for our, our work uh, on developing micro GC. We wanted it to be pocket sized and to be able to uh, analyze um, VOC mixtures of arbitrary composition, complexity, and concentration. So that was our ultimate goal. And over the years, we've produced a lot of prototypes that are attempting to, 
to do that in, in one way or another. And so this is just the latest set of prototypes. What I'm going to focus on today are PEM1 and PEM2, and particularly uh, PEM2. And we've, we've published papers on these uh, recently in the literature. OK. So uh, here's the, the worker guy that I showed you before. I found out that his name is actually Chuck. Um, and so this is the model we started with. And our vision was to be able to put a, uh, an instrument on the, on the belt of a worker that could uh, get the kind of uh, analysis, speciated quantitative analyses I talked about before. So we want it to be belt mounted, battery powered, and, and autonomous. So we approached this problem in basically two phases, the multi-year phases. The first one involved the generation one PEM prototype, which is shown here. All the key analytical components are shown here. Uh, the intention was that it would serve as a test bed for the gen two wearable. Uh, this one is not battery operated, operates on mains power. And uh, you can see here's our pre-concentrator focuser. In this system, we had two uh, columns in series. And uh, we had the uh, chemi resistor array that I'm abbreviating with, with that. And then a whole bunch of valves and pumps and other components. Uh, none of these were pre or, uh, microfabricated in our system. Um, and uh, we used a, la a laptop with LabVIEW control and just, you know, we, we learned lessons from this and uh, made mistakes and figured out how to optimize the analysis. So here's an image uh, halfway through the build of the instrument. And we, we did all of the building here in-house, much of the design. You send out for pre, uh, printed circuit boards, but we designed them in-house. And this thing's about nine inches wide by about five inches deep by about five inches tall. And you can see this is the finished instrument next to a uh, desktop computer keyboard. So it's a little narrower and actually a little uh, 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 shorter, or less deep, uh, but a little bit taller. And uh, these are a couple of columns here. All of the analytical components are on the top and all the support stuff is, uh, is here on the bottom. So this was used to uh, then allow us to move on to the Gen 2 prototype. <laughs> and that's shown uh, schematically here. We used a very similar pre-concentrator focuser design, some subtle changes. Uh, same thing with the chemi resistor array. And then we did a, a pretty big redesign on the columns, though essentially similar in terms of their capability. I'll say more about that in just a minute. So then we got together with uh, my former student, Willie uh, Steinecker, who uh, uh, started this company, VGC Chromatography. And then it's, he's got a sort of a subsidiary called TCM Global. And uh, they came up with this con concept diagram that incorporated all the components. And then they ultimately built, uh, this is the very first prototype that uh, came off the line. Um, I show it here on a scale. I should have shown the weight. It's about two kilograms, so about four pounds. This is the size. And then we had battery power, and the initial uh, power requirement was about 11 watts. Uh, we got that cut in half, actually, ultimately. And we have a, a microcontroller on board here. And so um, no one else was willing to stand up and serve as the uh, spokes model for the, for the uh, money shot here. Uh, so I got called upon to do that. And so this is our first prototype. Uh, the very first day we picked it up uh, down at, at Willie's Place in Ohio. Uh, you can see it's a little too large, but uh, really not bad for a first prototype. So what I want to do now is walk you through the details of each of the key components of the system. And, and hopefully uh, convey to you the, the, the time and effort and thought that went into the design of these. So what you're seeing here uh, in the upper right is uh, an image of our PCF, pre-concentrator focuser. These are actually two separate devices, uh, but they were uh, shown here to show the, the top view and then the bottom view. This is the heater uh, 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 films on the back of the, of the device. It has uh, two cavities that are etched into it using microfabrication techniques. These are silicon chips with glass cover plates on them. And we use two different adsorbents. Uh, these are commercially available uh, uh, graphitized carbons. One's Carbopack B, the other one Carbopack X. They have two different uh, specific surface areas. And here's a uh, micrograph image of what they look like. They're irregular carbon solids. And we use two different uh, uh, surface areas because we want to distribute uh, the VOCs across two different strengths of adsorbents. So the surface area determines the strength. For the less volatile compounds, we want to capture them on a lower surface area. For the more volatile ones, we need a higher surface area. 
and then we load in one direction and then inject in the other direction. And we use capillaries for the interconnects here. Here are some uh, stats on the size and then the amount of mass of each. So very small, you know, a few milligrams is not very much. And then the flow rates for loading and desorption. And then in order to get the sharp injections, I'll tell you in about in a minute, we have to heat at exceedingly high rate. So this is a very high heating rate. And we're able to do that because these are so small and we can dump a whole bunch of uh, voltage across them. So there are two functions served here, the trap and the release. And so for trapping, uh, we had to make some concessions, uh, but we decided that we would do selective trapping and, and the, the selectivity would be based on volatility. And so we picked a volatility window that we defined as being uh, 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 less volatile than 13 kilopascals. Uh, now, if, if you're not familiar with vapor pressures in these units, uh, that's about that's the vapor pressure of benzene. So that's our uh, actually high cutoff in terms of volatility. And then we also needed to pre-trap out uh, the very heavy compounds, and we define that as a dodecane here, which has this vapor pressure. So that's our vapor pressure window. And in order to determine how this functions, we had to run some tests. And so you're seeing here some breakthrough curves. So this is, uh, we, we expose the device to steady atmospheres of each of a whole bunch of chemicals, either individually or in mixtures, and see how long we can go without seeing it come out the, uh, the other end. And so we found that for benzene, which is our benchmark compound, we could sample 30 milliliters of air without seeing significant breakthrough, by which I mean 10% uh, of the challenge concentration coming through. So there's lots of lighter compounds here, more volatile ones that we are not gonna capture either at all or only partially, and we're not claiming to do quantitative analysis of those. But anything less volatile than benzene would fall out here and we can do quite well in trapping that quantitatively. So that's one way to define uh, one end of the, uh, of the performance uh, uh, spectrum for this device. Then of course, we have to be able to inject these efficiently. So that's another criterion. And by that, I mean, we need to get it all off, no residues, and then try to inject it in as sharp a band as possible at a flow rate that's consistent with separations on a GC column. And that's three mils a minute for us. And so we found that we couldn't do that very well without uh, implementing a technique called split flow injection, where we would pass a higher flow uh, through the, the pre-concentrator and then just tap off uh, two-thirds of it and vent it and then send the rest of it to the GC column. And so in this way, we were able to get uh, peak widths that were uh, for injection that were less than one second for all of the compounds in our range and particularly good for benzene. I should say that our, we've done a more recent project where we've been able to divide to get this down by about five-fold down to under 200 milliseconds uh, injection for something like benzene. But for this prototype, this is as good as we did. And then uh, this shows a chromatogram from a bench scale GC with a long column and a flame ionization detector here. Uh, you can see the peaks are, are really nicely shaped and that, that's partially an indication of how well we're injecting. In particular, the early eluding compounds here, one through seven, we're getting even partial resolution of these. These are the tough ones to separate, and these are the ones that really drive the sharpness of the injection band, because some of these others don't really require the sharpness, these do. Uh, number seven here in this uh, test set was benzene, so all these are more volatile. And so this is just an indication of how well we're doing, and we did quite well. Let me move on to talk about the columns. So in our PEM1 system, we had uh, two separate columns that were three meters long each. Uh, for the PEM2 system, we decided to explore something called zone heating. And for that, we created a one single monolithic column shown here, top view. Uh, and this has a total uh, channel length of, of six meters. And so the, the channels in our columns uh, are similar to the capillaries that one uses in a GC, bench scale GC. But because of the way we create them using the etching processes, they have a, cross, they have a rectangular cross section. And for ours, uh, the dimensions of that were 250, uh, 240 by 150 microns. We used a PDMS wall coating. And um, so each one of these is really a two meter subsection that's interconnected with each other. And uh, so the inlet, you can see barely up here from this capillary comes into the first one and the outlet from the third one is here. So the flow comes in and it spirals into the center 
and then reverses flow and spirals out so that it connects to the second one and spirals in and out to the third one, et cetera. Uh, we wanted to implement this zone heating concept, so we had to etch some fins or, or gaps between the uh, different subsections to get thermal isolation. And so the, this is the top view, this is the back view of the, the three different heaters. And then this is the concept shown here that we, that we were thinking we wanted to save some power, save some energy. Uh, and we thought we could inject our mixture here and have the first part heated, these are cool. Let the compounds elute from that first section and then turn off the heater here and then heat up the second one rapidly, do the separation there, then turn that one off and then heat up the third one and then have them elute out the tailpipe. Uh, this was uh, difficult to implement. We had to do some uh, what's called band trajectory modeling and things. And so you have to predict what the retention is, but it worked. And in the best case, we got about a 30% reduction in energy, which is pretty impressive. Uh, in the end, we didn't uh, utilize this in the prototype, though, uh, because it was just a little too complicated to implement. Finally, for the detector, so I, uh, I said before, we use this chemi resistor technology, and we use a, an array of them. And in this case, we, we had 10 elements in our array. Uh, this shows a picture of the chip, an enlargement of one of the chemi resistors, and then a US quarter for, for scale. And what's going on is, is summarized here. So what the chemi resistor consists of is just uh, a series of interdigital uh, electrodes. This is just metal, and they're overlapping uh, to have this overlapping finger pattern. And then we deposited on the surface of those uh, layers of these uh, monolayer protected nanoparticles. So this is like four nanometer diameter gold, self-assembled monolayers with different functional groups uh, at the tail of those uh, monolayers. Now, if you, if you apply a voltage across here, you'll drive what's called a tunneling current through the, uh, the film. And as vapors come out of the column and they reversibly uh, sorb and desorb, that will lead to uh, swelling and shrinking of the film. And since the resistance of the film is exquisitely sensitive to the distance between the nanoparticles, we can get really sensitive detection of VOCs. And so that was the approach that we took. Uh, these are the dimensions of the uh, electrodes in the chemi resistor. We had a heater on the back side. This is glass substrate, and then we had a, a, a lid that had a, a deep reactive ion etched silicon channel in it with these dimensions so that the flow would only go across the detectors, not these out here are the bonding pads and, and electronic stuff. So that's our detector. Okay, so. Now, getting back to the uh, sort of uh, system level discussion. So there are a bunch of questions you have to answer in order to make one of these instruments and then make it work. And so these are some that I've uh, kind of addressed earlier, size, weight, power, battery life, and uh, onboard control. And so these were what we ended up with for our first prototype. Here is a picture of the prototype with the top taken off so you can see the components. Uh, this is the pre-concentrator, separation column, chemi-resistor array. Uh, we've got these small valves, commercial valves on a manifold. There's another one underneath. And then we decided to go with an onboard carrier gas of helium, and that's a canister with a regulator there. Uh, we had looked at systems that you just use scrubbed ambient air, which is the first thing you think of. Uh, but there are trade-offs with that, and uh, in particular, the chromatography you can do is, is kind of uh, undermined by using air. So we went with helium, and we paid the price in terms of size and weight there. People also ask me, why don't we integrate all of these on a single chip? And uh, um, the reason why is that we have to, uh, you know, fill or coat each one with a different material. And if they're all on the same substrate, that's difficult. And then each of them has its own uh, temperature requirements. And they're, so to put them on the same chip, we would have to isolate. And it turns out that we, it's just hard to do that and hard to do it well. So those are some of the questions, but there are more. And so, uh, you know, which VOCs are you going to go after and how many and what are the concentrations, what are the interferences? And so uh, this sort of catch-22 uh, list uh, a quote here is what you face uh, and what you learn soon after trying to design an instrument. And that is, in order to determine what air contaminants are present and at what concentrations, you need to know what air contaminants are present, present and at what concentrations. That seems kind of odd, but it is absolutely true. So an instrument like this is not going to be used to go out and, and test the unknown environment. You have to have a stable environment where you know at least pretty well what's going to be there. 
because you have to optimize the conditions for analysis. You have to choose the right adsorbents, the right GC conditions for separation, and then uh, and have the sensor array operating at a correct temperature and have the right uh, you know, sensors in it. So we had to answer these questions and we picked, okay, if we can do 20 compounds, we'll declare victory. I already talked about the fact that we made a concession here to define our target chemicals as any VOCs that would fall within this vapor pressure window. And then by definition, then interferences would comprise compounds falling outside of that vapor pressure window. And then we said, if we can go down to a 10th of the TLV for each of, any, of the 20 and out to two, we actually went to four times the TLV, uh, we would say that's pretty good for doing quantitative analysis for worker exposure. That would meet the goal. And then how, how rapid? Well, we were able to do about once every six minutes. So we, we thought that that would be fast enough for the time resolution of exposures. So uh, jumping past PEM1, uh, PEM which I could talk about for the rest of the afternoon, um, I'm going to just jump into some, our, some of our early results for PEM2. And we did some initial characterization testing with a, uh, a mixture of nine VOCs from benzene to trimethyl benzene. And uh, we optimized things and we were able to get uh, this kind of separation in uh, about two minutes uh, after sampling for just a half a minute at a relatively high concentration. So overall analysis time of three minutes. Now I should have explained what I'm showing you here are the traces, the chromatograms from each of four sensors in the array. And these acronyms are just the names of the nanoparticles that we had on each surface. And we only use about four sensors in the array because of limitations on data acquisition for the portable instrument. Uh, and also, you don't really need more than about four or maybe five to do the job in these. So overall, the peak shapes are pretty good. A little bit of tailing, but overall pretty good. Not so good here, but, uh, but overall, we were pretty happy with it. And we did calibrations. We got really nice linear calibration curves, which makes life easy. And then the response patterns we got from just taking the slopes of these calibration curves, and those were unique enough. Now, in this case, when you have uh, full separation, the identification uh, capability is, you might argue, less important, but we would argue it's extremely important because you're able to actually identify what the compound is uh, by its response pattern. And that's not uh, uh, currently a capability in uh, portable instruments other than the GC mass spec we talked about before or the FTIR. So good linearity, we had detection limits that were outstanding. Uh, just a few nanograms, which corresponds to this range of concentration for a five mil air sample. Uh, and then I already talked about the response patterns. And then we ran some uh, short or medium term stability tests to show that uh, yes, indeed, we stayed stable. And that means that the patterns are stable as well. Um, and so, uh, you know, everything was good. And we said, okay, well, that's nine compounds. Let's push the envelope a little bit. And so we took it out to 21 compounds. And what you're seeing here is the collection of uh, chromatograms. Uh, we changed out one of the uh, sensors here. Um, and uh, for those 21 compounds from the, the same instrument I just showed you that we got for, for the nine compounds. And so the 21 compounds are listed here. So we started at benzene, ended at dodecane. And like I said, that was our vapor pressure window. And it's about a 500 fold range of vapor pressure. Uh, the conditions of sampling and analysis are given here. <clears throat> I'm not going to go through this, but uh, I will point out that we did do that two to one injection split. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in just a moment. And you can see that, again, the peak shapes are pretty good. The separation is pretty good, but you'll notice that we have some binary overlaps here, 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 and here. And then you'll also notice that our OPH sensor kind of crapped out on us. Uh, these, these tailing peaks are merged and uh, turns out it was a bad film. And so this is one of the liabilities when you're dealing with these nanoparticle films is it's a real art to uh, cast them and to get them to stick to the surface and behave. So this, this kind of misbehaved a little bit. But to, to push the uh, story further, I'm going to focus on this uh, sensor, the EOE sensor channel. Um, and this was the uh, chromatogram that I just showed you, just reproduced here. And, it, and this was with a two to one split. And uh, so, as I said, one of the problems we face is that we don't have uh, perfect uh, separation. We have either full or partial overlap here. So to be able to identify which and how much of, the, uh, of each of these uh, binary mixtures, so to speak, are present, 
we have a problem. But here's where the chemiresistor array comes in. So if we look at any pair of these partially overlapped compounds, uh, we have the uh, four channels of response that yield these, these um, patterns. And so the first pair here happens to be trichloroethylene and heptane. And you can see just by visual inspection that the response patterns are quite different. And by using quantifying that using principal component analysis, we're able to show quantitatively in, um, in PC space, so to speak, these projections here that the patterns are very different. And that's what these two circles represent. And then the mixture of the two has to be tested as well. And we have good separation in, uh, in this uh, four dimensional space, which is projected down onto two dimensions uh, to be able to separate these. And, and so the same was true for MIBK and toluene here. You can see three separate circles. And if we skip over to the uh, ethyl butyl ketone and nonane, good, good result there. The place where we fell down was uh, ethyl benzene and xylene. And if you know the structures of these, you'll know that they are isomers. Uh, we're lucky to be able to separate them in the GC because they have very similar volatilities and structures. Um, and here the pattern recognition failed because predictably because they have the same partition phenomena. Now, luckily the separation was pretty good here, in fact, so that uh, we could probably separate and deconvolute their, their uh, contributions to that peak without too much trouble. But we ran some Monte Carlo simulations on these patterns, and that's really what these circles represent. These are the 95% confidence limits. So very well separated, except for this one exception. So let me take this one step further and then say, okay, we've got 21 compounds here. Uh, if we take them all at once, it's a very difficult single problem of pattern recognition um, if we wanted to identify them all. So what we did was to break up the chromatogram into a series of retention time windows. And the, where we cut these was somewhat arbitrary, but we you know, made it so that there were four or five compounds in any one window. And then we just treat each window separately. And that simplifies the pattern recognition problem. And you can see for those compounds one through five here, we've got really good separation. Again, these are the 95% confidence interval boundaries for all of the compounds one through five. And here are the compounds uh, six through nine, and here's the overlap of ethyl benzene and xylene. So there's our one problem. The rest look pretty good. Uh, C12 and C11, these are undecane, dodecane, and, and of course their patterns are very similar because they're homologous alkanes. But as with C9 and C10, any homologs uh, are easily separated in GC because they have very different vapor pressures, very different boiling points. So, you know, the liabilities that we have in separation are made up for to some extent with the patterns, and then the reliabilities we have in the patterns are made up for by the separation. So it's a nice complement, uh, uh, complementary technologies. Okay, so let me just provide about three slides on our field tests. We just did some very basic field testing. Uh, this is Nico, our electronics guy, and we got him all informed and uh, suited up in, uh, in protective equipment. He's wearing PEM, one of the PEM2 prototypes here and doing some just made up solvent transfer operations here using a hot plate and some beakers. And then we ran a, um, a capillary up here to get it into his breathing zone from the inlet to the machine. And then we co-located a capillary from our bench scale GC, which is sitting just outside of the plane of the slide here. And so we, we did a relatively simple approach first for our field, uh, mock field test, just five compounds. And you're seeing the output from our four sensors, very well separated here, no problem at all. These are the, the compound acronyms. These are their TLVs. And we kept the exposures below TLV just to be safe. Um, and then these are the conditions of analysis. We were able to run every five minutes for 60 minutes uh, using this protocol, one minute sample, two minute separation, two minute reset. And in that time period, we could run two quick GCFID reference samples. These are the patterns. They're all pretty different, different enough uh, given uh, in combination with retention time to be able to tell them apart. And so this is the list of activities that Nico went through over the course of the hour. And what you're seeing here are our money shots. So what you're seeing here are the traces over an hour of what the PEM2 yielded in concentration for each of the five compounds. And then the GCFID is shown here as the dotted line. And for three of, or four of these, they're almost superimposable. A little bit of error here in xylene. And then MIBK, a, a lot of error, actually too much. And we trace this back to an error in calibration. You can see it's a systematic error. So 
shift them all up and we're in good shape. So we got good agreement also among the sensors in the array represented by the error bars, good agreement between the PEM2 and the GCFID, and then I won't show it, but the pattern stability was also good over the course of the hour. So that's basically it. Uh, what I've shown you here is the first, and I think still only, uh, belt-mounted micro GC in existence. And we were able to develop it, uh, test it in the lab, and do a quick uh, mock field test. Performance overall was really quite satisfying. The detection limits were low for small sample sizes, and we could run about once every six minutes. Good linearity out to four times our benchmark TLVs for all the compounds that we're interested in. Uh, I didn't talk about power or energy, but they are quite low, uh, which uh, bodes well for operating for eight hours. Good response stability. The, via, the, the complexity, I'm sorry, the resolution of the compounds was pretty good. And as I showed, uh, we can uh, use the uh, pattern recognition capability to complement or fill in where, where we have overlaps. The mock field tests were very encouraging. Uh, this project is actually over with, but if we ever pick it up again, we want to go and test more complex mixtures or other mixtures to see uh, sort of how versatile it is, uh, go for longer, and then take it out to the field to, to see what it can actually do. So with that, I will thank you for your attention. I realize I'm running right up against the hour here. I want to acknowledge uh, this is a bunch of the group members. The ones in red circles were integral to this project. Uh, Professor Kura Bayashi and Rob Neiditz did our fabrication. There's Willie and uh, his partner Seth and other folks at uh, VGC that helped us out. So with that, uh, thanks for your attention. Thank you, Ted. So we have, uh, this is now 1249, uh, so uh, uh, in case you have to leave then it's okay. And But for those who can stay at least uh, 10 more minutes, please stay and then you can Unmute your uh, microphone and then you can ask. So anyone has any question? And so I think have... everyone should be able to unmute themselves, but if you can't, just shoot me a message and I'll take care of it for you. Well, one question I can raise myself that uh, people might be wondering about is what is the status of this in terms of commercialization? And uh, it turns out that Willie at uh, VGC has not picked this up to commercialize it, uh, but we have some other partners that we're talking to to see if they want to pick it up and, and take it so that we can uh, perhaps produce these and uh, get them into the hands of industrial hygienists to me actually measure worker exposures because the capabilities we're providing, I think, are quite compelling. One of the challenges is that they're probably too expensive. So uh, I don't know what the production cost would be, but it's gonna be probably over $10,000. And that's a lot of money to put into a single instrument to put on the belt of any number of workers. So that's a constraint that uh, we're facing, but uh, who knows, it might be worth it to uh, certain customers like, like the, the military, for example. So then, so the main uh, the advantage of using this system over like a bench system and then collecting the, like a biological specimen is more like a uh, real time and the short term exposure. And so like that's why the targeting VOC is now the like a main target compound. But is it also possible that this uh, system can also measure not volatile compound, but uh, unvolatile compound, but uh, like occupationally or environmentally uh, important contaminant? Well, so that's a loaded question, of course. Um, and, you know, we picked the volatility range that we did for good reasons, because it's really hard to deal with less volatile compounds. Um, and, uh, you know, you can do breath monitoring with this technology because you're generally dealing with volatile compounds. And people are working on extending the range down in volatility to, to do things like PCBs or higher molecular weight organics. Uh, this is strictly an organic chemical analyzer, though, so you're not going to do any inorganics or things like that. And uh, you can do water quality monitoring, too, but again, you have to have volatile components. So anything biological that's not going to have a vapor pressure would not be amenable to analysis by this kind of uh, 
technique. Hmm. And then, yeah, you know, you could argue that a lot of compounds don't require the time resolution we're getting here, but it's, we don't know that. And so dose rate effects in, toxic, in toxicity are not well understood. And plus, in, in terms of interventions, you'd like to know where the peaks in, are occurring so that they, you might be able to control better if you were to know that. Not to mention the time and, and cost saving of, of, of having the data delivered to you immediately rather than having to send out for it to a lab. Okay, so from the audience, so anyone has any question? Hey, Stuart. Hey, Ted, that's my cue, I guess. So, um, great talk as always. Um, I don't know if you can see this little gizmo here. Um, this is yes. the latest uh, Flow 2 unit, which has a ozone, NOx, VOC, and PM system in it. And you talked about the metal oxide systems, but I mean, the idea here is crowdsourcing these things. And right. do you think we're gonna actually see some speciated stuff that works for say, let's call it um, community science? What was the question? When do I think we will? Yeah, when do you think we're gonna get the technology that um, downsizes and makes it, you know, cheap enough to actually use in, say, right. epi studies. Yeah, not in our lifetime. <laughs> <laughs> I know that doesn't necessarily mean a very long period of time, but uh, no, and that, you know, I've been following, of course, the, uh, the community or citizen sensing field for a long time, and this stuff is too, just, just too complicated and expensive to make it commercially successful for, uh, for the general population. We'll be lucky to see it in, you know, in the workplace or even in the military who, and they have the biggest budgets typically. So I think we're gonna have to suffice to have our, our metal ox, you know, our TVOC measurements uh, for the general population, just as they're using these particle monitors to get basically just particle mass, uh, which is also of limited value for health effects or things like that. Uh, that's the sad truth. Yeah, thanks. <clears throat> I wish it was rosier. Actually, it's only particle optical characteristics even. <laughs> <laughs> well, right, you have the inherent limitations of any scattering method for yeah. the particles. But those are the most successful for those citizen sensing things, as you probably are aware, the, the particle monitors are the, are the ones that most people go after because they're cheap and easy. Problem is you don't have good sensitivity with those even you know, for environmental levels of particles in most cases, that's, that's what we have. Right. Thanks. <clears throat> Anyone else? Yeah, this is pretty technical stuff, but you know, this is what I love to do, and this is what it takes to to do this kind of stuff. And then, you know, hand I want to hand it off to people like Stuart and Rick Neitzel, who was who's, who's who was on for a while, uh, to take them to the field and um, do the work that they're good at, and I'm not real good at. So, we're about so that point. Ted, I have one more question. So the, you know, like in Ann Arbor, you know, one for dioxane is a, you know, the one of the like a chemical that uh, many people are concerned. And but uh, when I look at some like a biomonitoring uh, data, no biomonitoring study actually detect not uh, like in the like a, the community resident. So, and no matter. Actually, they even though they have some exposure, but you know, biomonitoring is has some limitation to capture uh, actual exposure because you know this is too like a volatile or the exposure level is not uh, you know high enough to detect. And but like using this more like a portable system. So do you think that this is a like a the possible choice to uh, detect and then assess? this type of chemical in the, not, not occupational setting, but in the environmental setting. Yeah, right. So we we thought of that. And, um, you know, one application you might think of would be for vapor intrusion studies, because you have this groundwater contamination and uh, and dioxane is, is volatile enough that you might expect it to, uh, to be able to evaporate into people's homes. One of the problems is that it's carried in groundwater and it's pretty water soluble so that the partitioning out of water 
is pretty low, unlike chlorinated solvents, which are the classic ones that are, uh, that are causing vapor intrusion problems. Uh, and so that looked like a non-starter for us already. And keep in mind, we, we can't reach the detection limits you need to reach for ambient or you know, even breath, low-level breath monitoring. We can't do low PPB. It's just not possible with this technology. So the workplace was chosen for, uh, among many reasons, because the concentrations that are allowable and that are found there are in the PPM range. And, and we can do those really well. But if you drop me by three orders of magnitude, uh, we can't do it without an add-on system to the front end, a big pre-concentrator. And then, you know, for, yeah, for, I don't know, dioxane, the exposures are so low. I mean, you, I guess you could conceivably find some on the breath. I suspect it's metabolized quickly and that the breath concentrations would be vanishingly low. So I, I don't see a real path there to something of a problem that we could solve with this technology. Stuart might know more, but that, that, that's my spin on it. 